Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. The, the, this panel is called Stories of the State, so I thought I would start with a story. Um, I was doing archival research in this place right here, um, Hatfield House, which is a home uh, about 20 miles north of London. It was built in 1611 by Robert Cecil, uh, an advisor to King James I. But I was there uh, looking at the papers of the 19th century Robert Cecil, this gentleman right here. Um, and he, he was a consummate 19th century British Tory. He was the head of the Conservative Party. He was a member of the House of Lords. He was a longtime Conservative Prime Minister. So I was there looking at his papers, doing some research. And I was called up at the end of the day by the archivist who invited me upstairs to look at the house. The lights were out. We turned on the lights and we walked down this long um, marble floored hallway. And with the lights on, we could see there was these giant oil paintings on both sides going up two, two flights, essentially, with patriarchs of the family going back centuries. As I looked at these paintings and stood in this room, I really had this distinctive kind of feeling because I really knew that I was standing in the home of the most powerful man in the most powerful country in the world at the apex of its global power in the middle of the 19th century. And what was so striking about that, though, was that there was an incredible juxtaposition because as powerful as Lord Salisbury was, looking at his papers down below was remarkable that there was this uncanny sense of fear that he had. He was really a panicked elite, looking at events unfolding uh, in Europe. So when you read the papers of this 19th century Lord Salisbury, you experience this real un this sense of foreboding about how the world is unfolding. So I want to read to you something from, written by Lord, this Lord Salisbury in 1860 on the eve of the suffrage extension that get granted the right to vote in the 1860s to working class men. So Lord Salisbury wrote, the mists of mere political theory are clearing away. The struggle between the English Constitution on the one hand and the democratic forces that are laboring to subvert it on the other is in reality, when reduced to its simplest terms and stated in its most prosaic form, a struggle between those who have to keep what they have got and those who have not to get it. Democracy is the right of eight beggars to govern seven Rothschilds. And what is more, to tax them. So you have a striking combination of power on the one hand and fear on the other. So as I stood there, I, I asked myself, how did the historical owners of this home and so many others like them who had so much to lose and so much power at their disposal ever come to terms with political democracy in the first place? How did they come to terms with political democracy without sabotaging its very birth? So this question is particularly striking, I think, because if you look across Europe in the 19th century, there's Lots of instances of landed elites, conservative elites, think here of Germany, think here of Prussia, think here of Spain, where these old regime elites blocked even modest democratic changes. Conservative elites frightened of the, about the calamitous potential consequences of de democracy blocked it. And once democracy came, tried to subvert it after the fact. So I thought to myself that if I could understand how somebody like Lord Salisbury or how conservative elites assented to democracy, I could go a very far way, in fact, in helping unscramble a larger historical puzzle with global reverberations. And the puzzle is how did European societies democratize? Now, if one looks at the period roughly between the 1830s and the 1930s, so this is often called the first uh, wave of democracy, there were in fact two different patterns of democracy. In one group of countries, summarized a bit here, uh, Britain, Scandinavia, Belgium, Netherlands, the expansion of democracy, by which I mean the expansion of the franchise, the increasing power of parliaments, the institutionalization of civil liberties, all of this proceeded in a very settled fashion. It was certainly hard fought, it was not providentially predetermined, but there was ever increasing democracy without disruptive constitutional crises. Polity scores, uh, which give, are a kind of imperfect measure, these red lines here kind of uh, give you some sense of how democracy proceeded across this century. In a second cluster of countries though, Germany, Spain, Italy, Portugal, and to some degree France, democracy proceeded in a very unsettled path. There were long periods of stalled reform and moments of breakthrough tended to be followed by major moments of back breakdown or backsliding. This is not just the interwar years, which a lot of people know about, but even earlier, for example, in the 1880s in Spain, 
where democratiza democratization ultimately was a highly unsettled affair. So you can actually assess how crooked or how straight the path of democracy was over this long period by measuring the ratio of the red line, which is the actual path of democracy, to the black line, which is sort of the quickest point between the two lines. This is just a way of measuring it and kind of summarize the score. And essentially, the higher the score, the more unsettled the process of democratization was over this long century. So looking at this slide here, this raises the question, a big question, why in this hun roughly 100-year window did the process of democratization proceed in settled ways in some places and unsettled ways in other places? Now, uh, traditionally, as, as Maya will also note, um, there are kind of ways that political scientists think about these things, and they have resonances for today, how we think about democratization uh, proceeding today. One view sort of generally emphasizes the rise of impersonal, kind of unstoppable tides of socioeconomic modernization bring democracy. A second view highlights the role of the working class or the outs of a political system wrestling political control away from elites. A th third view emphasizes the role of the middle class or the bourgeoisie in promoting democracy. Each of these three views have present day corollaries, of course, when we think about why countries democratize. And they also ha have a lot to say for themselves. Certainly the outs of a political system are critical, demanding democratic reform is a critical ingredient for democracy. But each of these accounts also hinge on a particular conception of democratization, which is that democratization occurs only as a process of overturning existing hierarchies or a kind of process of deep social transformation. Now again, there's much to this view, but what this view overlooks and doesn't contend with the basic empirical fact that democratization in the past and today does not occur only by erasing old pre-democratic elites from the story or from the map. It's also built on concessions to the old pre-democratic pre -democratic regime. So the challenge really is how to get old regime elements or powerful groups who might benefit from authoritarianism to concede democratic reforms and how once demo democratic reform happens, why they don't subvert it after the fact. So to put it differently, the first three views here that I have on the slide overlook the fear of democracy felt by anti-democratic forces and how that fear is overcome. So today I want to direct your attention to the fourth factor uh, that I view as supplementing these views. And that's the role of conservative political parties. So conservative political parties in the 19th century, a figure like Lord Salisbury, uh, parties were uh, the defenders of the old regime. Uh, in any moment of democratization, in fact, not just the past, but today, 19th, uh, 19th century conservatives have kind of uh, analogs. So you can think of Thailand's current military junta. You can think of Southern segregationists and racist Democratic Party in the US South after the Civil War. You can think of Fr uh, Spain's Francoist regime in the 1970s. The point that I want to make is that old regime elites don't just passively concede democracy when sufficiently threatened. A key question is, under what conditions do old regime elites comply with democratic reforms? So turning back to Western Europe, I think something key happened in Europe, and there's a lesson for today from the European historical experience. And this thing that happened only happened in some places, not everywhere in Western Europe. And what happened is that old regime elites discovered the power of political party organization. They discovered mass political parties. They discovered that equipped with political parties, they could actually concede democratization without necessarily conceding power. They could figure out how to win elections fairly. So in 1860, Salisbury was afraid of the Second Reform Act. By 1884, he actually helped negotiate the Third Reform Act, which was much more expansive. He had come to terms with democracy. So to put this again differently, something happened is that essentially old regime elites, where they were strong, democracy could proceed in a settled way. Conservatives went from being recalcitrant opponents of democracy to being reluctant Democrats. By contrast, in places where uh, party building for uh, the old regime elites was delayed, Germany, Portugal, Spain, Italy, they were more fearful of democracy. Democracy was rightfully regarded as an existential challenge. They regarded even marginal changes to suffrage rules as shattering their world because they knew with only equipped with weak party organization, they wouldn't be able to survive. So let me just be clear about what strong parties are. Um, because I think actually it turns out winning elections, you can win elections in non-democratic ways by cheating. But winning elections with parties is the democratic way to win elections. 
And political parties are actually a remarkable human invention, I think, that we don't fully appreciate. And what I want to emphasize is five institutional innovations that took place in the middle of the 19th century that were a key part of what this meant to be a strong party. First of all, the invention and development of the institution of the party whip. Um, so uh, I have a picture here of a Vanity Fair cartoon in the 19th century of a party whip in the UK, and you can't really see down at the bottom, it says whipper. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary uh, defines a whipper in these terms. It says, a whipper huntsman assistant keeps the hounds from straying while hunting. So what a party whip was, a whipper was, was did the same thing for members of parliament. This is a key invention. A second related invention is the invention of the par patronage secretary, which was essentially an office that distributed funds, whichever party was in office, the majority, to get bills through, legisl through parliament. Legis democratic legislative politics would have been impossible without this institution. A third innovation that came really in the 19th century is the registration society. Uh, so in the 1830s, after, after suffrage was expanded, um, uh, the question was, how do you get people to vote? And at first, the party whip was hired to go out to the countryside and try to figure out how to get people to vote because he's, he was used to buying the vote for people. But it turned out you needed more than just a party whip. You needed a whole organization to do this. And you had the development of these registration societies that registered voters and tried to disqualify the opposition party's registration. These are the original constituency associations for political parties. Uh, the the fourth, uh, fourth innovation was uh, the professional party agent. As these registration societies fought over who should be eligible to vote, there were inevitably lawsuits. So par politicians hired lawyers who were experts in election law. These are the original party agents. Eventually they realized we could just hire our own professional who's trained in election law, has to take a test, is a member of a professional association, and eventually you have the, the, the kind of initial party bureaucrats for political parties. And then finally, uh, the fifth innovation was something here that I call here an informal party social club. So the Carlton Club in London where elites got together. And if you've ever read a novel by Trollope, there's every, everything that's important takes place in these informal social clubs. And this is a key kind of uh, socializing organization, institution for parties. So the point here is that political parties developed and made democracy safe for those opposed to democracy. And they had three big consequences. First, they channeled social conflict. They were a kind of key buffer. It's what my co-author Steve Levitsky and I call a kind of soft guardrail of democracy. Politics gets channeled through parliaments and parties rather than on the street. Second, powerful people invested in these institutions, the institution of parliament as well as parties, because it mattered. And the, as, they, as professional life developed around it, people's livelihoods became invested in these institutions. Their own personal livelihood was premised on the survival of these democratic institutions. And third, this investment in skills and institutions also gave rise to a critical norm. The norm that, again, my co-author and I, Steve Levitsky, called the norm of mutual toleration, where each side regarded the other side as essentially legitimate. A professional ethos developed in which people realized sometimes one side wins, other times the other side wins. And there was a kind of toleration and an ability to learn how to lose gracefully. So the point then is that there's two kinds of countries in the European historical experience, places where conservative parties developed early, in places where it didn't, democracy was more stable in the first group of countries. But the question that I will kind of end with is why did these different kinds of, these two clusters emerge? And this panel is supposed to be on the kind of deep roots of these processes, and so what I want to talk about just briefly here is a kind of point that's pretty striking, that there's two kinds of countries. There was countries where parliaments continued to meet throughout the 17th and into the 18th century. There's countries where absolutism, where kings essentially closed down parliaments and parliaments never met. And that first group of countries, essentially the more, so I have here a scatter plot where I show uh, the frequency of parliamentary meetings in the 18th century with a bunch of countries. And then uh, uh, some political scientists have measured the strength of party systems in the 19th century. And what you see just in this bivariate correlation here is that in places where parliaments met regularly, parties developed more effectively including conservative parties. So I want to conclude then with just a couple of general observations about, I think, the lessons of this story that I've just told you. Conservative parties, first of all, are a critical hinge of history. Conservatives exist everywhere. The question is, do they develop as, as 
well-organized actors who can play the democratic game or not. Some people, or I've sometimes thought of this as a kind of dismal science vision of democracy because essentially what I'm saying is that conservatives have to win. For people who don't like conservatives, this is not great news, but I think it's actually a critical part of the story. In terms of contemporary implications of this, political parties are democracy's gatekeepers. They're key ingredient in democracy. Democracy is unthinkable without political parties. And in a world in which, and I, I spend my time mostly studying contemporary European politics, in a world in which you have mainstream established parties decomposing in front of our eyes. Uh, you can think of uh, France today. You can think of the fate of the SPD and the CDU. The question is, can democracy survive without political parties? And that, I'll leave that as an open question. Thank you. <laughs>